send her back. Isn't that nice? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. We're going to take a little break on the local stuff for this evening, although I think I would like to pick the brain of my friend Joe Camerano, the political science director at the Providence College. I was going to come up with an adjective, but uh, the brain is working slow in the humidity. Great to have you aboard. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, you know, Joe and I are famous for predicting that Donald Trump would never see the White House. I can't do the shows without reminding him of that, but I, I, I join in that. I, I don't assert that he took the leap. We both did. And years later, we are still not very good at predicting. But the truth of the matter is that science, uh, po uh, pol political science, is, is, is that still, even though the science, I think, is certainly fluid. Um, let's talk about the science of re-election amidst what's been going on this week. It's crazy. Check out this headline. Uh, that's nice. Now, look, it's not like I haven't used the term idiot for, for public officials, so I'm not going to be a hypocrite here. But when you are the commander-in-chief and you start to talk about elected um, officials in this particular way, it, it takes on a whole different kind of... Trumpian thing. Here's what the network had for us at press time. The president's supporters in North Carolina turned his racist tweet into a rallying cry. After an extended attack on Representative Ilhan Omar. She looks down with contempt on the hardworking Americans, saying that ignorance is pervasive in many parts of this country. Omar responded to the president's attacks and the crowd's chants in a series of tweets last night. She quoted poet Maya Angelou, saying, You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Omar has a history of launching vicious anti-Semitic screeds. In an exclusive interview with Gail King this week, Omar addressed past comments that some have criticized as anti-Semitic. Would you like people to, would you, would you like to make it clear that you are not anti-Semitic? Oh, certainly not, yes. Would you like to make that clear? Yes, I mean, and that, I, nothing I said, at least to me, um, was meant for that purpose. The president kept up his attacks on the so-called squad. Talib Presley. Cortez. Somebody said that's not her name. I don't have time to go with three different names. We'll call her Cortez. The president is highlighting the four liberal freshman lawmakers in an effort to make them the faces of the Democratic Party ahead of 2020. Their comments are helping to fuel the rise of a dangerous, militant hard left. Trump supporters we spoke to before the rally agree with the president's approach. I like it because it seems to work. Uh, you see all these people out here. I mean, he's, he's got a lot of following. Everything is so freaking touchy with all of them. They have no sense of humor. They have no common sense. Um, I'm sorry, just a bag of idiots. When I was 15, I stopped watching professional wrestling on TV because it got kind of old pretending that this created reality was not real. And I finally sort of put it aside my freshman year in high school. And then I went on and I studied for 30 years. Now I'm back to watching professional wrestling. That's all this is. It's performance art. It's a 35 to 42% base that watches the WWF of politics and eats it up. And literally, if you just listen to that first gentleman, his evaluation of the president is confined to the execution of the performance art. Right. That's right. And the number of people that are showing up to watch it. Mm -hmm. And you know, 99% of all of these people who code the rallies, all these people who call people bad names, both on the left and right, it, it does happen more on the right. Empirically, we know that. But it happens on both sides. 
99% of them are, are safe. They understand that it's performance art. It's that 1%, that 1%, which we're talking a million people who are a little less controlled in what they do, and that's wh where the real danger is. And I think I mentioned this before, President Trump is unleashing a very small segment of his base to potentially do some real damage. I mean, we're now talking about election day violence in this country and how we prepare for that in large part because we have a president who likes to play a game rather than do governmental work. Okay. Since I mentioned the concept of political science, is it still? It is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said with a deep breath. It is. Uh, the political science. It's almost like you're a scientist, but there's been a brand new political discovery, and you're all trying to figure out what it is. Well, that's exactly right. It's, it's not unlike a physicist finding some sort of abnormality that disproves a grand theory. Mm. That, you know, and we're hoping that it's just an abnormality, not an indication that we were wrong all along. And so the political science basically says certain things are going to happen, but they haven't been happening quite as much. The, the reality is, right now, political science predicts President Trump is going to get reelected because he's an incumbent. Incumbents usually win because the economy is doing relatively well and it's doing better than it had when he entered office. That's a good predictor. The abnorma abnormality uh, analogy. What would the ab? I mean, it's kind of a pretty stupid question, in a sense. But how would you define the abnormality? Uh, the uh, I would exp I would say that the tone and the tenor of conversation coming from political elites, and again, I, both sides are guilty. I I actually didn't watch the presidential debates last time around because there are 20 of them. They had 30 seconds, 40 seconds, a minute to answer things, and I knew it was just sort of this beauty contest that I wasn't going to bother with. Um, so it's happening everywhere in politics that we've kind of created this notion that delivering the people something that they're going to glob onto is the whole purpose for for doing this stuff. Now, what is the what is the um, the chance that this is a temporary phenomenon? Well, you know, there's a you know, <laughs> to use science again, uh, there are two ways it can go. Are we in an evolutionary cycle where we're devolving into something very different than what we have always had in our lifetime? Or is there this singular phenomenon that is disruptive but will go away kind of like a recession or kind of, you know, or like a, uh, a natural disaster that it's not clear. We don't know. And we won't know until after things have sorted out. That's the problem of science. You need data to analyze, and it takes a long time to do that. And so maybe in three years we'll know. Maybe in five years. All right. We'll come back. We'll talk about uh, what happened at the rally last night and what the squad dynamic does, not only for the president, but for the Democrats. Are you speaking to Nancy Pelosi? Our teams are, are in communication. Our chiefs are, are meeting. But shouldn't it be a face-to-face? -face? Right. I want to know if you are She's speaking. She's the new member, not the speaker. No, but she I want to know. She has every right to sit down with her in any moment, any time, with any of us. Yeah. She is speaker of the House. She can ask for a meeting to sit down with us for clarification. Mm -hmm. The fact of the knowledge is, and I've done racial justice work in our country for a long time, acknowledge the fact that we are women of color. So when you do single us out, be aware of that and what you're doing, especially because some of us are getting death threats, because some of us are being singled out in many ways because of our backgrounds, because of our experiences and so forth. But but I think Alexander, the question should be... are you interested be, in having a conversation face-to-face -face oh, absolutely. with Speaker, House Speaker would, Nancy Pelosi? Why wouldn't she sit down with her? Yeah, no, absolutely, and we've reached out to that end. So what Donald Trump has done in, in, in focusing on these women, I mean, he, he's, he's playing his own double-edged sword game, but he's, he's caused a clear fissure in the Democratic Party to bubble up and, and for Nancy Pelosi to have to deal. And to find out that they're actually not having spoken, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, I, you know, when, whenever there's a big, big class of freshmen in, in the House of Representatives, 
there are a lot of people who don't really understand how things normally work. And the idea that you should be talking to the speaker as a, as a freshman is a relatively new phenomenon. You basically sat down, did what you were told, and every once in a while you had to preside because nobody wants to preside over the, over the proceedings. And so I think the expectations are, are unreasonably high f for a lot of first-termers. First um, and I also yeah, think the, the media are paying way too much attention. The American public doesn't understand the protocols and, and the stature sure. Uh, 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 ladder climbing dynamics and culture of the House of Representatives. So when the general public, the sees, members don't understand. Well, the new members don't yeah, understand. Right. So, but but in as in as in as much as a lot of the rules have been broken, period, that Nancy Pelosi has to suffer a national interview with the squad, suggesting that they haven't gotten together yet, uh, or, or reporting that they haven't gotten together yet. It, it creates. Lots of questions in, in the minds uh, of folks. Well, but Pelosi has a real problem because she doesn't want these four to be stars in, in this party because their their brand is a losing brand. Well, their brand will probably make it hard for the Democrats to keep control of the House if their brand is the dominant message of the Democratic Party. And yes, that's that's exactly right. Pelosi's trying to keep together a much more heterogeneous ideologically heterogeneous group than the Republican side, which is very, very homogenous. They're very, they all generally have the same ideology. The Democrats, that's not true. Number of districts the Democrats won this past election that they're not likely to win unless these members can go back and say, I voted in certain ways. That shows I'm a moderate. And so, you know, Pelosi's got a hard job. Speakers should be a hard job. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, many speakers have had to look at you know what happened to Boehner on the Republican side. He couldn't he couldn't keep it together. Ryan got exhausted, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly by this president, I think. Right. But the Gingrich blew himself up. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a hot seat, mm -hmm. no doubt. And the, the finesse that she's had to exercise is interesting, right? So, she comes out extremely strong and uses uh, the term racist tweet. Uh, which I'm kind of confused over the parliamentary argument that was uh, placed by the Georgia um, representative to suggest that she couldn't articulate that which was written into the, the actual condemnation language mm -hmm. of the resolution that right. they put forward and, and passed. Yet she immediately yesterday stopped short on the impeachment uh, on the impeachment thing and got that thing tabled. Uh, yeah, so, you know, so I mean that's a, it's a high wire act for her. Right. One of the problems is that. The articles of impeachment really were not, was not submitted to actually start investigating. No, it was about and, his behavior. Right. And so, you know, the real way, if you really want to re impeach a, a president, you start an impeachment inquiry. Right. And my guess is that Pelosi's still hoping that the old procedures hold because that's where things come to light. That's where real deep investigation might occur, not mm. always. And our own Congressman Cicilline, who's been, who is the, you know, the communications guy now for leadership and who, prob who has been on television more than any other Democrat, is breaking and, and calling for impeachment inquiries to begin, uh, you know, ahead of what due diligence say, mm -hmm. hey, by the way, I don't know if you guys remember this, this guy, Bob Mueller, right. uh, he's actually coming next week to repeat that which he has reported. That's uh, right. uh, that's all, that almost feels like archaic news, like ancient history Who's in a Bob way. Mueller? Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, the Cicilline approach is a much more gradual, much more methodical, much more institutional approach that historically um, is legitimate. His argument would be it would get more, uh, get more diligence if you began the inquiry formally. And what what is the job of Congress in its oversight capacity, in its constitutional responsibility, other than no stuff? And so that makes a lot more sense Yet to it's me a dead end. than the symbolic vote that everybody knew was going to be defeated, and most of the Democrats didn't vote. But it's a dead end. We all know it's. It, it, we all know it's a dead. And it's not a. And dead do you want? Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want a? So I, I forget no, who it's said not it. A dead you, end. Why? It's not a dead end because you assume that the goal is removal. If the goal is really revelation and exploration of wrongdoing, and institutional and constitutional wrongdoing, then it's not a dead end. 
you can you can achieve that purpose by looking at the extent to which he's abusing the power of the presidency so under the concept without of, removing him uh, under the concept of you want a wounded you know and again this is a political term uh, a wounded president versus a martyred president yeah how far does an impeachment inquiry go that crosses from wounded to martyred well it's, because it's, martyred is yeah. is is exactly what he's hoping for. Well, and the interesting thing is the very thing that leads to the inquiry is going to continue during the impeachment. He's going to order everybody to disobey the subpoenas of the House, you know, which constitutionally is dubious. I'm not going to say it's unconstitutional, but it's dubious. He's going to misbehave by not appointing people in a regular fashion, instead doing uh, sort of interim appointments so that he doesn't have to go through the Senate. So, you know, the, it, it is a dead end, but it's also a way of highlighting, okay, there's a reason why we want this guy out. Let's look at the reason why we want him out, even though we're not going to get him out. All right. And of course, the Republicans have this weird dynamic of protecting this president and they're it's not weird at all huh it's not weird well it's it, it, totally it, rational okay so we'll come back and find out why it's totally rational i suggest that it's minimally weirdly rational stay with us i want to make absolutely clear that our opposition to our socialist colleagues has absolutely nothing to do with their gender with their religion or with their race it has to do with the content of their policies. Uh, Presley would not even refer to the president uh, by the title. Look, we disagreed with Barack Obama on a lot of things that he did. The policies, as our conference chair laid out, there are a lot of policies that we had disagreements on with Speaker Pelosi and her Socialist Democrats, just like we had disagreements with a lot of Barack Obama's policies, uh, but we never disrespected the office. Um. Okay. You want the rationality thing? Yeah. Okay. Look, re Republicans have the most coherent ideological objectives and goals that they've had in a hundred years, and yet they don't. Ha they didn't have a base of support to achieve that. They tend to be business conservatives and social conservatives. They they want businesses free reign, and they want imposition of order in a, in a sort of morally certain way. They haven't been able to get those two groups to work effectively and control government, and here comes this guy, you know, it's like your crazy uncle who gets you to, you know, your vacation two hours faster, but you're worried you're going to, you know, crash and burn on the way. And so the crazy uncle always gets you there, and that's President Trump. And so they're going to just sit back and go like this and follow along. Crazy uncle and doesn't cost, know what they're thinking. Right. He, he doesn't have an ideological uh, objective. No, he, Trump doesn't. Have, it's all it's all him. It's all his you know, fame, notoriety. And their ideology and their and goals, are, uh, re re refresh the ideology and objective is? The Republicans' ideology and objective is we want a country that shrinks the size of government on areas not related to the national defense. Um, we also want a country that asserts a certain moral certainty and preserves a certain social order. Um, and, and how is that coming with this crazy uncle? The, the way it's coming is, well, we get to, you know, we get to be tougher on crime if we want. We get to, we have an attorney general who won't prosecute a cop who choked a, choked a guy to death uh, on Staten Island, you know, uh, bar. Uh, you know, so we get the things that we think preserve law and order. We get an assertive U.S. militarily, but we also get the business-friendly policies that actually a majority of Americans don't want. And we get it through, the, through our crazy uncle driving too fast, but who gets us there? Uh, he's figured out how to get to the White House when nobody else was able to do that, so we might as well hook up hook our fortune to them and cross our fingers and, and the, the price that they have to pay is they have to support these insane things that he does. You know, the, you know, the idea that you're going to tell U.S. native-born citizens to go back to their country or an American success story like, like Omar, uh, that she should go back to Somalia. What do you think it's, the, it's the what, price what, what, that you pay what do you think for the, getting the policy? What will the political impact be of rally after rally uh, 
exchanging lock her up or send her back. What 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 price, if any, does Donald Trump pay for that? Well, I think I think the real potential price he, he's going to pay is only going to be known in the election. Um, if he loses, that's going to be the price he pays. But that's the only price he's going to pay. Well, well, I mean, obviously, it's the, I'm, I'm asking, how, is there a percentage of price that he pays? Yeah. The, by the yes. way, yeah. the only thing that anybody seems to be thinking, worrying, and talking about is the election. Right. I, I, I mean, know. What substantial discussion are we having other than immigration? Well, that's the professional wrestling metaphor that I was using. Right. It's not about reality. It's about the game. It's about the make-believe. Make it's about the way we present this and that the other stuff is irrelevant to everybody watching. So we all know it's fake, but we're watching anyway because you know, we're interested in it uh, or we have no other choice. Um, the consequence is policy isn't getting done. We have a trillion dollar deficit this year in an economy with full employment. What happens if we go into recession and we start a recession with a trillion dollar deficit? What's going to happen? We're hoping the crazy uncle that gets us there safe. We don't know. But that's the price that they're paying. They're taking a big risk, and it could destroy the Republican Party, just as Trump did a number on the Democrats in 2016. It could also lead to the Republican Party being the dominant party for a while. We just don't know yet, because we're in the middle. These Democrats, any one of them have a chance? I mean, we've got uh, B-roll of the debate you wouldn't watch. I would argue that the, way, the, the top five candidates 15 can yard, be 15 Trump. 15-yard penalty for my political science expert to say he Why? didn't watch a debate. Why? A year and a half out with 60-second responses? I flag, read their stuff. Flag, I flag. read. I don't need to watch TV 15 for Fifteen yards stuff. the other way yeah. for walking, you know. Uh, I know you study, too, so huh? you know, I, I'm sure your viewers study as well. They read. They don't just watch. I think sometimes, well, I'm not going to prosecute you here. I just... What, what, what comes from this group? Does Joe Biden hold on and become formidable? You know, I, I, most of my colleagues who are pretty sharp and one who predicted Trump would win says Biden's dead. He also says Sanders is dead, that they're not going to win. They're not even going to win one primary election. I don't know. I, I remember I'm out of the business of predicting. Um, Elizabeth I do think Warren will light a fire that will that will win the, 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 the yeah, and, yeah. and lose the national election. You know, the one thing I did watch excerpts of, of the debate, and I have to say that little ingredient that that's like that unknown element, Harris, hmm. she has it. Yeah, she has it. Yeah. She keeps calling for Medicare for all. America doesn't want it. Good to see you. We just keep the conversation going. Sure. Be right back. Kind of a Target 12 summer activity binge. Uh, they've been working hard in the newsroom here in the building. And tomorrow night we'll talk to Tim White about what they've been doing. It's not necessarily always a slow summer. We'll talk to you on the radio at 3 until 6 tomorrow afternoon. Thanks so much for tuning in. Prepare to stay cool.